People often think of democracy as the best form of government because it is government of the people, by the people, and for the people. So you may bristle at the title of our next guest's book. It's called The People Versus Democracy, Why Our Freedom is in Danger and How to Save It. Its author is Yasha Monk. He is a lecturer at Harvard University, senior fellow at New America Think Tank, and the host of The Good Fight podcast, and he joins us now. Great to have you in that chair. Pleasure to be here. So nice to meet you. I want to start with the title, obviously, because the people versus democracy is kind of perplexing. What are you trying to say there? It's a little ironic, isn't it? Democracy yes. is meant to be the rule of the people, and why mm -hmm. are they against it? Well, I think uh, a couple of things. A, when you look around the world, you can see people freely voting for candidates that seem to have pretty strong authoritarian tendencies mm -hmm. that concentrate more and more power in their own hands and make it difficult for people to actually vote them out by democratic means a few years down the line. Um, it's also a reference to some of my academic work. So, you know, when you go back 20, 10, even five years, most political scientists, most journalists, most citizens assumed that our democracies were safe, but we didn't have to worry about them. And one of the reasons for that was that people were meant to have this very deep commitment to living in a democratic system. And I argue that that's no longer the case that people are deeply disenchanted with our political system. No, that is pretty clearly the case, and, and we'll follow up on that more as we continue our conversation. But I do want to follow up on this first. The people, the notion of the people, in inverted commas, do the people in that respect really exist? No, they don't, but um, this is a little bit of the irony of what populists claim to do, right? So, you know, we're often talking now about the rise of populism. We say, you know, people like Donald Trump or Viktor Orban in Hungary or Narendra Modi in India, um, Recep Erdogan in Turkey, and it's a little puzzling what they actually have in common. Well, one of the things they have in common is that they claim that the people in capitals exist mm -hmm. and that they stand for the people, that they represent the people. So another sense in which it's the people versus democracy is that it is the danger that comes for our political system from these politicians who claim that they and they alone represent the true people. Well, in fact, you say in the subtitle, our freedom is in danger. How do you see that manifesting itself around the world today? Well, let's take a country like Hungary. Hungary is interesting because um, it was one of those countries that five years ago, political scientists really said were consolidated, which is political science speak for safe. We don't have to worry about the political system. We know that 20, 30 years from now, it'll still be a democracy. Well, that, when Viktor Orban took power there in 2011, he started to undermine the independence of the state media, to force the sale of a lot of the private media stations into the hands of his political associates, to reform the judiciary because it was terribly inefficient, mm. supposedly, um, giving himself complete control over what happens there, to put his own loyalists into institutions like the Electoral Commission. And we now have elections coming up very soon in Hungary, which are no longer going to be free and fair. Because, in what respect? Well, that Electoral Commission, for example, investigated all of the opposition parties for spurious campaign finance violations, fined them essentially all of the money that they had, but neglected to investigate the party of the prime minister, the ruling Fidesz party, in the same way. And they didn't get fined at all. So this is just one of many ways in which the playing field between the government and the opposition is no longer even. And therefore, it is an illiberal as opposed to liberal democracy these days, yes? Absolutely. So I think we have to remember that our political system has two key elements, two key things that we're trying to accomplish with it. One is individual freedom, right? We don't want to have the collective telling us what to do, what to say or not to say, whom to worship or not to worship, with whom to be in a relationship with or not in a relationship with. Um, and that's the liberal element. It's nothing to do with liberal and conservative. Um, it's to do with the protection of individual rights, of minority rights, of the rule of law, of the separation of powers. We should just we, clarify that. When you say liberal, yeah, you don't mean liberal versus conservative. You mean liberal as in free speech, bill of rights. I don't mean either Trudeau versus Harper, nor exactly. do I mean Barack Obama versus George W. Bush. I mean the long liberal philosophical tradition that has really founded our system of government mm -hmm. and that we used to have a broad consensus around, uh, a, a part, for, uh, independent of political affiliation. Yes. Yeah. So, so first thing was freedom. Second thing? The second thing is democracy. Mm -hmm. right? The second thing is that we don't just want to have individual freedom, we want to have collective self-determination. We together rule ourselves, and that must mean, in, in my sense at least, that popular views are actually effectively translated into public policy. 
Now, I think that these two things are falling apart in various ways. But one of the obvious ways is the rise of populists, who, yes, are often popular, who, yes, are often democratically elected, but they start to undermine the rights of minorities and they start to undermine the separation of powers and the rule of law to such an extent that eventually it may no longer be possible to get rid of them by democratic means. One of the most distressing things I have noticed in the last five years, I guess, in particular, and you see this in public opinion polling, millennials no longer seem to be as committed to living in a democracy as certainly I was at their age. Why? So this is some of the things that I show in this book, um, that in the United States, for example, over two thirds of people born in the 1930s and 1940s say it is absolutely essential to me to live in a democracy. Mm -hmm. Among millennials born since 1980, uh, less than one third to. Less than one third less say one it's third. essential to live in a democracy. And there's also a growing openness to authoritarian alternatives to democracy. Mm -hmm. So again, quoting the states, but there's lots of other examples. Some 20 years ago, one in 16 Americans said that army rule, pretty stark, straightforward alternative to democracy, mm -hmm was a good system of government. Now one in six say that. And among young and affluent Americans, it's actually gone from six to 35%, a nearly six-fold increase. So why? Well, I think there's a few reasons. There's some things that are specific about young people. Um, I think they haven't experienced the threat of fascism or the threat of communism. So they may not see, you know, they're very aware of some of the shortcomings of our political system, and they're not very aware of the shortcomings of other political systems and how much worse they are. I think partially we haven't done enough, frankly, for young people to benefit economically. So many of our public policies are skewed towards older generations, making sure that pensions are safe, but not doing very much to actually help young people get trained and educated and so on. It's so not the case in Canada, I have to tell you. The, the, I mean, federal and provincial governments in this country are chasing the millennial vote. I mean, you want to start with legalizing marijuana, you want to start with free education for, you know, eligible post-secondary students. What about housing policy? Do you have policies here that mean that if you bought a house very cheaply in Toronto or a big apartment in the 70s or 80s, you do everything to make sure that that remains uh, nice and expensive and you can eventually sell it and have a good retirement? But if you are 25 years old in Toronto today and you actually have a decent job, you probably have trouble paying rent? Uh, well, if, if you're 25 and have a decent job in Toronto, you, you can't buy a home in Toronto. That's about it. Probably in most big cities in this Country. And so that's one of the big ways in okay. which young people are saying, you know what, I'm not going to have a better life than my parents did. Even if I have a good job, even if I have a decent career, I'm not going to reach the standard of living that my parents did. And that's a unique development, right? So if you want to zoom out, because this is not just about the young, it's among old age group that you see a disenchantment of democracy. It's particularly strong among some young people, but it exists among all, all age groups. Look, from, from 1945 to 1960, the living standard of the uh, average U.S. American doubled. And again from, from 60 to 85. It doubled. And okay. since then, it's essentially been flat. It's essentially been stagnant. Right? And in other countries, it's not as extreme. Right? Canada has, frankly, more sensible and fair economic policies. And those ensure that a larger share of economic gains do go to average citizens. But here, too, think about the transformation of the life of an average Canadian from 1950 to 1980. Mm -hmm. It probably went from, you know, perhaps having a car or not having a car to having two cars in, in your household, from a small apartment that may have been sort of coal-fired um, in order to heat, it was really back-breaking work, mm -hmm. to having nice central heating, right? It is all of those kinds of huge transformations that you saw in those decades. On one salary. On one salary. Mm -hmm. um, now you have two people working and being stressed, and you know, probably being a little better off than we were a few decades ago, but not much. Mm -hmm. And so that makes a real transformation where people used to say, hey, you know, do I really love politicians in Ottawa? Do, do I think that the paragons of moral virtue? I don't think people ever thought that. But they said, you know what? They seem to be sticking to their end of the deal. In the yeah. end, they're doing something for me. So let's give them the benefit of a doubt. Now people are starting to say, eh, I don't know, but I trust them. They haven't really done much for me. So. Let's try something new. Perhaps let's try a new uh, Premier of Ontario. Well, we'll see about that. That's uh, still, <clears throat> I don't know, what is it now? A little under 70 days away when that grand co consultation with the people will happen. Uh, but yeah, I mean, your point is well taken. The, um, the opposition party's been in first place in the polls for three straight years now, so. But we'll see, we'll see. Let me, let me try this on for size here. You gave a TED Talk in Berlin. 
It was put up to YouTube, and one of the German posters had this to say in the comments underneath, and we'll translate here. I hope it's one of, of the us. less colorful comments, because there's <laughs> certainly some colorful comments on YouTube. I, I'm so. pretty sure it's not X-rated, but here we go. <laughs> I wish that his kind, meaning you, his kind, would choke on this word democracy. You must be kidding. We have no democracy. We have governments which are for or against the people, but the people are not informed, or rather they are manipulated by the constant propaganda in the mainstream media. How can he, meaning you, describe this as democracy? This guy is completely beside the point. Now, this is apparently a German woman living in today's Germany. Uh, what kind of democracy does she seem to have in mind if the one that she thinks exists is a sham? Well, um, so first of all, I think, you know, the, the hatred for the media is a real problem. Right? People like you do a very serious job. And to say this is all lies and propaganda and it's probably all paid for by this or that special interest is, is just inaccurate. And it's one of the ways in which um, you know, very extreme opinions and, and, and very hateful opinions have become part of our mainstream discourse in a way that I find quite concerning. Um, I also find this idea that we don't live in a democracy at all at the moment um, laughable, especially from people who, I, I'm not talking about this particular commentator, um, but who often turn out to have great sympathies for countries like Russia and so on that really don't have democracy. Now, having said all of that, I think that, you know, there is this deep sense that people have that the system isn't responsive enough to us. And there's good reason for that. So that's why in my book I talk about these two dangers to liberal democracy. One, which we've talked about a little bit, which is democracy without rights or a liberal democracy, the rise of a populist. But that is in part a reaction against the system we've had for a long time, which you might call rights of our democracy or undemocratic liberalism, mm -hmm. which is a system in which, yes, individual rights are reasonably well respected, not perfectly, but reasonably well. You have a separation of powers, you have a rule of law, but for a whole set of reasons, the political system isn't responsive enough to the preferences of ordinary people mm -hmm. because of a growing role of money in politics, because of the revolving door between lobbies and legislators, but also because lots of decisions have actually been taken out of a democratic contestation. So rather than being decided in parliament, they are decided um, in independent agencies, by independent central banks, um, in international institutions, um, through trade treaties, a lot of which do a good and important job, but, but do have a cumulative effect of saying, yeah. well, I don't get to decide about yeah. some of the most important things in economic policy, for example, because I don't set the interest rate. Let me get you to compare two countries that you know well. You are born in Germany, of course, living in the United States right now. How would you compare the levels of liberal democracy? It's funny, if, we, if I'd asked you this question 50 years ago, it would have been a slam dunk. I'm not sure anymore. Which country is, is a better example of liberal democracy today? That's a great question. I mean, I think in, in, in both respects, I would probably say Canada by- well, Canada wasn't one of the options. Sorry, Germany or America? Oh, Germany or America. Um, I would say um, on the liberal element, well, it depends. I, I don't think I would give a sort of blanket judgment, actually. It depends on the particular dimension you're looking at. Right. So even when you look at something like the inclusion of minorities in, in the country and the respect of, for their rights, I think on the one side, Germany has a less... Uh, it has a, obviously extreme history of, of racial persecution in the Third Reich, um, but one that was bounded in time and that didn't sort of shape the country from its origins in quite the same way. And so as a result today, I don't think you have the lingering effects of past discrimination and so on that you do in the United States. On the other hand, um, you also have much more of a hangover from a sort of mono-ethnic, monocultural conception of who is a real German. Right? So I, I was born in Germany, I'm Jewish. To a lot of people, look, when I was on book tour in Germany a few weeks ago, a, a radio host at a big radio station in Germany said, well, look, you're Jewish, so what do you think about Trump's decision to move the, Israeli, the American embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem? I said, mm. I'm Jewish, so I have to answer questions about Israel. What's, what's the, right? Um, uh, so there's an idea in Germany that is much stronger towards people, for example, who are the descendants of so-called guest workers from Turkey and so mm -hmm. on, that if you aren't of German stock, if you don't descend from the German nation, then you don't really belong. That's much less strong in the United States, where for all of the ongoing discrimination, I think the bottom line 
recognition that somebody can be uh, a, a US American, even though they might be uh, black or brown and they might be born in other parts of the world, um, I think is, is, is there for a large majority of the people in the way that it is in Canada as well. So that's one example in which I'd say in, in one respect it's better in Germany, in another respect it's better in the United States. It's interesting because I thought you were going to say exactly the opposite. I thought you were going huh. to say, you know, Germany, in spite of its past, just admitted a million refugees from the most godforsaken part of the world and did so proudly and, and relatively easily, relatively speaking. I mean, all things considered. I know the story is not yet finished and, and, and of course there are complications. And we've just had the election for the first time since World War II of a far-right populist uh, and in parts far-right extremist party to the mm -hmm. Bundestag, which in some polls is now the second strongest party in the country. I understand, but, but all things considered, you took a million people in in Germany and, and you know, they didn't burn the country down. Right, right. America seems to be going through an orgasm of xenophobia right now, led by the man in the Oval Office. Absolutely. So you're not disagreeing with me then? No, I agree with that. I mean, certainly when you compare the governments that we currently have, I think it's very obvious that uh, I would swap the German government for the American government any time of the day. Um, and that uh, Donald Trump is an extreme example of mm -hmm. a liberal democracy. Thankfully, also a reasonably uh, ineffective example of a liberal democracy. If it was a populist Olympiad, um, people like Viktor Orban would take the gold medal and uh, you know Trump would be on position 74. Um, uh, but he certainly is um, attacking minorities in pretty shocking ways and undermining the, the rule of law and the separation of powers in extreme ways. When you look at his attacks on the Department of Justice, on the FBI, uh, on media, even on owners of private companies who displease him, uh, like Amazon, um, that's, that's shocking abuses of power, um, which are very dangerous. Yeah. David Frum is a friend of this program, been on many times. You were at a conference at Yale mm -hmm. last fall on a panel with him, among others. And let's play a little clip here. This is what he had to say about democracy and multiculturalism. Sure. Sheldon, go. As we contemplate the strength of democracy and this vulnerability of democracy, we have to take more seriously, in my opinion, than we have done, the connection that was argued in the 19th century between the nation state and democratic modes of government. We, are, we have not found a way, and I don't think we ever will, to do democratic government in any way other than through nation states. Nation states made of citizens, nation states with borders. Many people of goodwill saw the answer to the problems of our time was to weaken the nation state in favor of broader attachments to humanity. What we discovered instead as we've dissolved it, what we are discovering, is that people do not move from citizenship bonds to broader bonds, but to narrower bonds, to ethnicity, and to race. And so question, is globalizing politics compatible with liberal democracy? Well, I think that's a slightly different question from what David was saying, right? So um, I think the bottom line question is how should we think about different forms of identity and particularly national forms of identity in this political moment? And there I mostly agree with David, right? So look, I grew up, I, I mentioned this before, as a Jew in Germany. So of course I was tempted to look at Germany's past and the role that nationalism played there and say, let's run as far away as possible from nationalism. Let's leave that behind the 20th century, which is so cruelly shaped. Uh, so that's one instinct on the left, right? Another instinct is to say, let's celebrate every form of identity, whether it's uh, racial or religious or sexual or gender identities, but let's not celebrate national identity because that's the one that we find scary, right? Mm. I think that both of those instincts are, in some important ways, a mistake. Um, nationalism, to me, is a half-domesticated animal. That if you leave it alone, the worst kinds of people are going to come in and bait it and stoke it until it runs wild. Hmm. But it can also serve a very positive function. It can have real uses. And one of those is around solidarity. Canada is a big country. But if something happens, a natural disaster, God forbid, you know, on the west coast of Canada, I think people are, who are sitting in Toronto will have compassion for people there. Even for the far away geographically, they may have different, uh, of different ethnic origin, they may have different religion. But as long as you think, well, we're Canadians, and that means that we owe them something, that means we're going to help them. Well, that's a beautiful thing. Now, the way to do that, I think, is to fight for what I call an inclusive concept of nationalism in which we absolutely defend members of identity groups that are being discriminated against, 
from those attacks as are happening now, frankly, from the White House in the United States. And we defend them without footnote, without reservation, without qualification. But we also emphasize that we're doing that precisely because we have more in common than divides us. Because we do think that it's important to have a positive identity as Canadians, as US Americans, as Germans, whatever it may be. So on that, I completely agree with David. Now, there's a follow-up question on that, from that, which is to ask about, well, what does that mean institutionally? What does that mean about how we should feel about institutions like the United Nations? What does that mean for how we should feel about free trade and so on and yeah. so forth? And there I would say this. It's perfectly normal that politicians act in their own national self-interest. People like Donald Trump sometimes claim that no US president before him had the interest of the American nation at heart. I think Barack Obama would rightly bristle at that. And I think when you look at some of the tough ways in which Barack Obama sometimes advocated for US interests, I think it's untrue. And that's, that's good, that's fine. It's okay for national politicians to advocate for the nation's interests, but what's important is that they recognize when the interests of a nation are furthered by cooperation with other nations. And I think that is very often the case, as Canada has always recognized. And the thing that makes me scared of somebody like Donald Trump is not that he says, I'm gonna fight for America. Fine, you're a politician, that's your job, okay. But recognize that America's interests lie in peaceful relations with its neighbors, in a strong support for NATO, in free trade with many of its most important partners. You know the Ontario political scene a little bit. A, a little bit. A little bit. Well, uh, let me ask you a little question there, because you wrote in Slate recently in a column, the rise of political newcomers is as likely to be a sign of democratic health and vitality as it is of impending sickness. And, you know, in Ontario right now, we're going through kind of a very interesting time. We are, I think it's fair to say, the most multicultural province in the whole country. There's a, there's a better than even chance that a white, middle-aged, male, um, populist leader of a conservative party uh, could win the next election in June. And if that happens, um, you have to believe me when I say he will do so with a lot of help from multicultural of communities, course. from African-Canadian communities, and so on. Uh, I guess the question is, populism, therefore, can't simply mean angry old white men anymore, can it? No, no I don't think it ever did. Um, I mean, look, in, in the United States, there's been this idea for decades of the emerging demographic majority that because at the moment members of ethnic minorities mostly vote Democrat, you can assume that as the share of the population grows, the Democrats will just end up always having a majority. I have always found that to be deeply unconvincing for a whole set of reasons. One of which is that people can actually change their identity, but this assumes that um, people who have one Latino grandparent will think of themselves as Latino 20 or 30 years from now. Mm. Well, actually, in, 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 already they don't. People who have one out of four Latino grandparents have an 18% likelihood of self-identifying as Latino. The other 82% identify as white. Um, but it also assumes that there isn't a form of populism that could prove very appealing to minorities. Now, it depends on what that is, right? I mean, if you have somebody like Donald Trump um, saying, look, you know, Mexicans are rapists, it, it does have a limiting effect on the number of Mexican Americans who are willing to vote for him. But there are forms of populism that either victimize some minority groups in order to mobilize support among others. And I think one real possibility for the future of the United States is a populist leader who is themselves a, a member of an ethnic minority. Hmm. Somebody out there with that resume right now? No, I don't think there's anybody who quite fits that bill yet, but it's not too difficult to imagine. Hmm. Um, well, I mean, there are some people like, um, uh, the, the current secretary uh, for, for, for housing, Ben Carson, um, who was very anti-Muslim and in some ways very anti-immigrant and is himself black. Yeah. So, so certainly the makings of that. Um, so that's one reason. And the other reason is that the deep fonts of populism go beyond this ethnic appeal. They're partially mm -hmm. economic and they're rooted in a sense that the government is failing and that everybody out there who's making decisions is really aligned against you. They're really cynical, they really don't care about you. So you just need somebody who is courageous enough and politically incorrect enough to go and clean it all up. Mm. And that's something that appeals to people regardless of the race or religion, as long as they feel they're not gonna be victimized. And Doug Ford is running on that very much so in, uh, here in the province of Ontario. You ask a question near the end of the book, and I, and I want to get your take on this now. 
When we look back 20 years from now, are we going to look back at this orgy of populism, of illiberal democracies, as a kind of a historical hiccup? Or, you know, is this the beginning of a descent into something more permanent, long-lasting, and concerning? Look, I, I wish I had the answer to that. Um, the first thing is to say is that we, before we had the answer to that, um, until very recently, serious scholars thought we could assume that the future was safe for democracy. I think Francis we now Fukuyama. Have, well, Francis Fukuyama, um, who, who, whose thesis is often caricatured because people don't actually read you know, the book and the act. Mm. I know you've, you've had him on many times in the program, mm -hmm. so, so you're certainly not one of those people. But his core assumption was shared by most political scientists. There's a very mainstream political science study from the 1990s saying, once you've changed governments for free and fair elections a couple of times, once you have a GDP per capita of more than about uh, uh, 16,000 uh, Canadian dollars in today's terms, you're safe, you don't have to worry, you're fine. And people believed that, even if they didn't like the slogan of the end of history or something mm -hmm. like that. Well, I think that's no longer the case. We can no longer assume that. That's the first big takeaway. So what are the different scenarios? Well, I think that we need to understand that populism has been rising for decades, and that's easier to see in systems of proportional representation, like most European parliamentary systems, than it is in Canada and the United States, where you have two-party systems or free party system to some degree in Canada where you don't see that rise as quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but populism has been rising for 20 or 30 years. It's been rising in lots of different countries. And so we have to look at the structural drivers of it. And it's some of the things we've covered. It's economic stagnation. It is um, the challenge of building an equal multi-ethnic society, which is especially deep in European countries and Asian countries that have had mono-ethnic conceptions of who belongs, but which is also, as you know, difficult in countries like Canada and the United States. And it's the rise of the internet and of social media, which makes it easier for people to sort of bundle and politically mobilize those kinds of frustrations. Now, if we deal with those drivers of populism, I think our political system can survive. But if we just think it's a matter of finally convincing people that Mr. Trump sometimes is not especially truthful and may not quite live on his promises, and as long as people have just got that through their head, everything is going to go back to being normal, well, then I think you're being naive. Look at the Ford family in Canada, right? I mean, people, I think, realized that Rob Ford, in the end, was not the best mayor of Toronto, and yet his brother, running on a very similar kind of platform, now seems likely to become the next premier of Ontario. Well, I, I, I will say it again for the record. Campaigns matter, so we're not going to... Um, uh, the, the outcome of the election we're not going to resolve right now. But, uh, but let me follow your historical pattern here. There's a lot of people who are tempted to say Donald Trump invented populism and he's the first example of it. No, Rob Ford came six years earlier. But then, as you would point out, in Italy, Silvio Berlusconi came even earlier than that. Is that what, would you and, and, and the striking thing about Silvio Berlusconi is that it shows how difficult it is to get rid of the sort of populist playbook once it's really entered mm -hmm. your politics. And so he's back, back again. He's back. So go back yeah. to 2011. Mm -hmm. Berlusconi had governed the country for nearly 20 years on and off, but he was the dominant figure in Italian politics for 20 years. Um, he was deeply unpopular. He had a dismal record. And when there was rumors that he was about to resign, most Italians were elated. Uh, thousands of people spontaneously came out in the center of Rome to celebrate. There was this beautiful amateur uh, orchestra and choir that, that came together to sing uh, Handel's Hallelujah. Mm. Well, seven years later, as you're saying, he's back in Italian politics. And what's even scarier is that, so he's now a kingmaker and has a lot of power. There's two other populist movements, which are in some ways more radical, especially the far-right extremist league, mm -hmm. that have a lot more of it and that are a lot more powerful. Five Star between and the League. Five Star and the League. Between them, the Five Star, the League, and Berlusconi now have nearly two-thirds of the vote. And by the way, they have stronger support among young people than among older people. Um, so even once a populist has failed in his promises, even once he's seemingly gone out of your politics, it can come roaring back very quickly. Hmm. In which case, Yasha, let's finish up on this. You deal with young people all the time in your work at Harvard University. What are you attempting to tell young people in order to get them to reopen their minds to the notion that liberal democracy is where it's at, and damn it, kids, dig in. One of the problems of institutions like Harvard University is that we don't spend enough time proselytizing, and I use that word mm -hmm. wisely, for our political values. 
Um, look, all in the history of political thought, from Plato to Aristotle and from you know, Rousseau to the founding fathers, um, Everybody who thought about how to build a self-governing republic realized that the first task was to transmit your political values to the next generation. And we sometimes pay lip service to that, but we don't take that nearly seriously enough. In so far as we talk about our political system at all in, in, in many high schools and especially in universities, we point out its many flaws. And there are real flaws. We have to be upfront about those. We have to struggle to overcome them. All of that is true. But we also have to teach people why it is better to live in Canada or the United States than it is to live in Russia or Turkey or Venezuela or China. And unless we do that, people aren't going to have a real commitment to their political system. So that's one thing I tell them. The other thing I tell them is that, you know, sometimes conversations with me can turn a little depressing. I hope I haven't depressed the <laughs> audience too much. Perhaps classes with me can also turn a little depressing. But I'm not depressed by everything that's going on. I'm actually energized by it. Because when I was growing up, I thought those important debates we were having in politics, think about a topic like same-sex marriage, but there were limited stakes, big stakes, but limited stakes. We didn't think that our very freedom was a danger. Well, I think now it is. And that's frightening, it's scary, but it's also inspiring because it means that what we do now really matters. And unlike the citizens of China and Turkey and Venezuela, we still have a freedom to go and fight for our values. So let's do that. It is all in Yasha Monk's The People Versus Democracy, Why Our Freedom is in Danger and How to Save It. A brilliant read. So good to have you here at TVO with us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.